Hello, dear friends. My name is Dr. Igor Atabekov. I am clinical oncologist practicing since 2010 in Russia. Uh, today we will um, talk about uh, copper, copper sulfate, uh, in anti-cancer therapy because more and more I hear about this remedy among cancer patients. Copper sulfate is a crystalline uh, inorganic compound. You can see here it is highly soluble in water and uh, it has some toxicity. It is toxic to many organisms. It is toxic to bacteria, fungi, algae, insects, etc. And this is the basis of its uses. For example, it's used in agriculture and gardening as a herbicide, as the fungicide, to kill different microorganisms that will uh, damage uh, the plants. It is also a nutritional supplement. It is added uh, in small amounts into animal food uh, to prevent uh, the copper deficiency in uh, livestock. It is used in industry also and it is used, uh, for example, in water treatment uh, to kill algae in swimming pools or reservoirs with water. And again, more and more, I hear the stories from the patients who take uh, copper against Let's talk about it in more details. I'd like to start from the question, is it safe to take copper sulfate? Of course, if we use it to kill microorganisms, we understand that this substance can be quite toxic. It has some historical uh, and uh, outdated uses. For example, it was used as antiseptic to sterilize wounds, uh, but uh, in very diluted uh, concentrations. This practice was uh, entirely, entirely replaced by other safer options. Also, it was used to, uh, as emetic to induce vomiting, for example, in cases of acute poisoning. But it's risky because uh, it can cause poisoning itself. And here you can see the symptoms of copper poisoning. Uh, it can be severe abdominal pain, vomiting, diarrhea, metallic taste, liver or kidney damage and failure, and even can be fatal. So copper sulfate is toxic and uh, should be handled with care. And uh, even if you work with uh, copper sulfate, uh, for example, in agriculture or you're cleaning the water, then uh, you need to use a special equipment to protect yourself and also uh, prevent a spillage into the soil because it can kill a lot of good plants and it can poison the water and harm fish and uh, other organisms there. But copper is still uh, used uh, in cancer treatment. So we, uh, I promised you to talk about cancer treatment with use of copper. You already understand that uh, this substance uh, must be considered a quite a dangerous substance. But uh, science is uh, researching it uh, in uh, the field of cancer treatment. Uh, and there are several directions uh, like copper chelation, copper ionophores that uh, causes cuproptosis induction. I will tell you what is that. Don't be afraid of these uh, hard medical terms. And copper-based uh, nanoparticles. First one uses drugs to bind and deplete uh, systemic copper, starving the tumors. Second direction is use molecules to shuttle copper inside the cells, causing toxic overload. And this directly triggers a unique form of uh, cell death called coproptosis. We talked before about ferroptosis, the same but with iron. Here it's a different mechanism called coproptosis because copper. And third uses nanoparticles for targeted delivery and multimodal therapy. So let's cover this uh, a little bit in more details. The role of copper in cancer research uh, has increased dramatically in recent years. The dual role of copper in cancer refers to its ability to both promote tumor growth and under the right conditions it can trigger cancer cell death. This makes copper metabolism a very active area of cancer research nowadays. Okay, copper as a cancer promoter. That means it promotes its growth and metastasis. Cancer cells has, have a higher demand for copper 
than normal cells because they hijack copper dependent processes to support their rapid growth and spread. Uh, fueling growth and spread. Uh, copper is needed for functioning of enzymes essential for uh, cell uh, growth and uh, proliferation and tumor growth and uh, for remodeling the surrounding of this tumor um, to promote growth even more and to metastasize and to protect uh, the tumor from the immunity. Next, copper is driving angiogenesis, meaning copper is crucial for uh, creating new blood vessels to uh, supply the tumor with oxygen and nutrients. Uh, again, uh, and the third one is uh, activation of signaling pathways. Uh, signaling pathways of molecules that will uh, make tumor grow and divide. As you understand, tumor needs a lot of copper. Next, a substantial body of preclinical evidence demonstrates that copper-based strategies can be effective, effective against uh, many cancers. Researchers are exploring two main approaches, depleting copper to starve the tumors or overloading them with copper, causing these uh, toxic levels of copper inside the cells, uh, cancer cells, causing them to die. And uh, of course, nanomedicine uh, show also significant uh, promise. And uh, the results are uh, as you see here, it will um, disrupt the, uh, the tumors uh, use copper to make this protective environment to protect from immunity. If we disrupt these uh, copper-dependent mechanisms, uh, we can make this um, tumor very sensitive to immunity. So it loses its protection. And now immune therapy, for example, or human immunity itself may work better. And uh, here we see that uh, it really could enhance uh, the um, infiltration of uh, tumor with immune cells. So it's very interesting and promising. Next, copper as the uh, cancer, cancer blocker, or cancer inhibitor. Uh, while uh, cancer cells need more copper, as we talked about before, the abundance of copper can overabundance can be toxic. And the researchers are exploring the ways to exploit this vulnerability. First of all, inducing oxidative stress, uh, excess copper can uh, produce more free radicals that will damage membranes, proteins, and the DNA of uh, cells, uh, also tumor cells, causing their deaths. And uh, studies on various cancer cell lines showed that really it was effective against, for example, uh, cervical, um, cancer or uh, glioblastoma, brain cancer, brain tumor. Uh, and uh, it triggers cuproptosis. It's, uh, as I told you, like ferroptosis, it's copper dependent cell death uh, that works through mitochondria, disrupting their function and producing a lot of free radicals. And as we see here, copper can bind the enzymes. Copper is very important for the work of enzymes inside the cells. And it can cause uh, proteotoxic stress and death of the cells. It, it can be effective against even very resistant cancer cells. It's very important. The cancer cells that we cannot affect with uh, chemotherapy or radiation therapy, very resistant. And of course, uh, nanoparticles, uh, they make small uh, copper sulfide nanomaterials uh, to bring them directly into uh, cancer cells and they already show some uh, success. For example, here they use lactoferrin plus copper nanoparticles and uh, uh, it showed a good effect against uh, melanoma. Here also against breast cancer, so they are developing nanomedicine. Again, it's crucial to remember that these copper targeting therapies are still uh, in uh, preclinical and clinical uh, studies, research. Self-medication of uh, copper may be dangerous. And the goal of research is to develop strategies if we're talking about over, uh, over um, abundance of copper, to make it toxic. Uh, so research is aimed at to, into targeting these high uh, copper levels into tumor, not in all the body, not to cause the intoxication of all the body. But as you understand, it's not super applicable uh, in uh, the home setting. This needs more technology. But 
I want to um, share with you some more thoughts. And as for me, it's already more applicable and more um, interesting. There are several articles here that say that in breast cancer patients, a higher serum copper to zinc ratio was associated with lower overall survival of the patients. Uh, the ratio was independent predictor of survival and stronger than either metal alone. Patients in co with colorectal cancer had higher serum copper and lower zinc and higher ratio between copper and zinc than healthy controls and healthy people. Uh, and uh, the uh, more disbalance was associated with bigger tumors. That means that uh, the cancer and cancer progression was um, associated with uh, this disbalance of zinc and copper. And normal healthy people uh, tended to have normal ratio or not as disbalanced ratio. The same uh, we know about hand and neck cancer patients, more disbalance in more advanced stages, and even BRCA carriers. You remember this mutation that causes uh, the individuals to have higher risk of different cancers, including breast cancer or uh, prostatic cancer or pancreatic cancer, ovarian cancer. This mutation and uh, even the person has just has this risk factor, but uh, no tumor yet, uh, they may have this disbalance. And the higher disbalance is the more chance to develop cancer in future. It's very interesting. That may suggest that maintaining the healthy copper to zinc balance may be a modifiable risk factor. Uh, that means we may um, decrease the risks uh, to develop cancer. And here, of course, we need to talk about why this happens. We know that uh, zinc and copper have competitive absorption. In the intestine, uh, they have the similar transporters that make them absorbed into our body. They will compete with each other. The other thing is uh, an interesting protein called metallotineoin, metallocyanoin, ah, so difficult name. And increased intake of zinc may improve, increase the production of this protein that will bind copper and not let it be absorbed. That means uh, if you want to decrease copper, you can not only take uh, the substances to uh, bind this copper and remove them from the body, called, called chelators, but also you can take more zinc with your food or supplements uh, and that will decrease uh, copper levels. That means this imbalance between zinc and copper is not just a side effect, but it looks like it's actively involved in tumor progression. Because as we talked already, uh, tumors need copper very much. And zinc, on the other hand, uh, it's need it is needed for uh, uh, proper immune function, it acts as antioxidant, and it regulates the cell division. Currently, this zinc to copper ratio is uh, regarded as a prognostic biomarker, uh, not a proven treatment. That means it's like diagnosis, like uh, you can check this ratio and see if this tumor will be more aggressive or less aggressive. Is it, is it already very spread or less spread? Will it grow faster or slower? Something like that. But supplements with zinc to reverse this disbalance uh, must be checked in uh, proper clinical trials on cancer patients. That's why for now it's not uh, officially recommended. Warning. Do not self-supplement high doses of zinc because indiscriminate supplementation with zinc can cause copper deficiency, which can cause uh, other serious uh, consequences like anemia or uh, problems with neural system. The goal is to restore the balance. The correct approach is that any intervention to modify mineral levels should be, we, should be discussed with uh, oncology team. For example, they can perform blood tests, check the levels of this um, minerals and check the ratio. And if it's needed, then uh, they can prescribe the supplements to the patients. And again, monitor the levels while the patient is taking these supplements. For example, check it in one month, in two months. So this is some personalized, uh, personalized advice from medical team. But as you understand, uh, you need to highlight this problem and highlight this uh, information when you talk to 
medical oncologist, so he will pay attention on that. Because this is not something that is uh, um, recommended by protocols uh, nowadays. That's all what I wanted to discuss with you for today. Uh, thank you for your time, thank you for sharing this video, thank you for your likes and uh, for uh, comments, and thanks to everyone who supports this channel. You can see these people on the screen now. That is very important for me. I wish you good day, God bless you, and goodbye. See you in the next videos. Don't be afraid.